Hey Bruce, it's so good to see you guys. Even all those of you who just had surgery, uh, it's so good to see you guys. I'm so glad you made it to church. And all of the rest of you, your smiling faces, they're beautiful. Let's stand and worship the Lord, yeah? Let's go, let's go.
everybody. It is so great to see you. We're going to get our praise on. In fact, I'm going to raise, read a psalm all about praise. It is Psalm 150. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his acts of power. Praise him for his surpassing greatness. Praise him with the sounding of the trumpet. Praise him with the harp and lyre. Praise him with the timbrel and dancing. Praise him with the strings and pipe. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. 
that because you live, we can live in your freedom. I just pray, Lord, over this sermon that you would just go before our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. And I'm just so thankful, Lord God, for so many things. And I'm, just, I'm thankful for this church family. I'm thankful for our pastors. I'm thankful for this church building. I just, I'm just really grateful, Lord, for what you are doing in our community and through our family. And I just pray you just continue to help us grow and become more like you and help our hearts to be softened towards you. And I just, I pray for anybody who doesn't know Jesus today that they would come to know you, Lord God. And I just ask that you just open their ears and their eyes and their hearts to see you and to experience you and to know you for the first time, Lord God. And I just, I thank you for what you're doing. It's going to be a great day. We love you. In Jesus' name, we all say, Amen. Amen. Let's go. Say hi to five people around you. Hi. Hey, good morning, Compass Church. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Hey, it's a holiday weekend, four days. Woo-hoo, yeah. My name's Skip. I'm one of your elders here at Compass Church. Uh, wanted to welcome everybody, and uh, we start off, uh, first of all, with our connection cards. Everybody's mostly familiar with these, but if this is your first time here, we want to hear from you. Fill that card out. Let us know a little bit about you. Uh, also, on the back of these cards, we have a place for prayer requests, praise reports. Please uh, take time to fill that out also, and we will collect these uh, in a few seconds or even later. There's a box that as you leave the church. Uh, you can drop that in. Uh, this is Communion Sunday, yay! Uh, so uh, I want to begin uh, first with uh, having our ushers come forward to collect the tithes and offerings. Uh, if this is your first time here, don't feel obligated uh, to give. This is our worship time and our uh, gift to you uh, as being here, and we thank you for being here. Um, when that Matt come up and talk about Celebrate Central Oregon. Thank you. Uh, So in two weeks from yesterday, there's a giant celebration called Celebrate Central Oregon. It's gonna happen at the Church of the Cascades Amphitheater up off Highway 20. It used to be called Christian Life Center. Uh, but now it's Christian or Church of the Cascades Amphitheater. So there's going to be a huge event there from 2 to 10 p.m. It's got all kinds of music there. It's got speakers. It's got BMX riders. It's got dancers. It's got skaters. It's got all kinds of stuff. Jump houses for little kids, food carts, all kinds of things. And some of the people going are Skillet, Danny Goki, We Are Messengers. Um, it's going to be really a really awesome event, not only for us to go to and and celebrate alongside other believers, but also to invite our friends to, because who doesn't want to go to a great concert? These these are Grammy-winning artists that are coming here to play, and and it's free. So on your seat, there's something that looks like a ticket, 
But if you look at the bottom of the orange, it says free admission. This is just something for you to take and give to one of your friends. You want to bring them along? Take this, hand it to them, say, come with me. It's going to be an awesome event. So that's two weeks from yesterday, Saturday, July 15th. We'd love to have you there. Thank you, Matt. <laughs> come on up here, Lexi Walker. <laughs> All right, we got a double hitter today. I got two for you. Number one, this Friday is our next parents' night out. Very exciting. It's for birth through eh, seventh grade-ish. Um, so if you've got, yeah, it's, it's all approximate. It's all good. It's fun. Um, if you want your kids to go, if you know of friends with kids, if you've got neighbors with kids, if you just see a kid in Safeway, hey, parents' night out is this Friday. Here at church, it's from 5 to 9 p.m., it's $10, and that will give you water games, Chick-fil-A dinner, we are playing games, we're doing snacks. They're making these cute little s'mores starfish things. It's going to be a lot of fun. I need an RSVP by this Wednesday, though, if you have kids who want to go. So please email me at Lexi at CompassBend.com or give me a text if you have my number, so that way I can figure out how much stuff I need to get for the kids. Number two. Don't forget, Fun in the Sun is coming up. That is our evening summer event for preschool through fifth graders, age four to fifth grade. And that is coming up July 18th, 19th, and 20th. That's a Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday night from 6 to 8 p.m. The link to sign up and register is now live. An email will be coming to you soon with that information. Make sure you sign up um, sooner than later so that way your kids actually get the right t-shirt size. Okay? That's it. Thank you. <laughs> okay, Pastor Kelly Jones has an announcement. Skip it's Reverend Kelly Jones. I just want you to know that. <laughs> hey, uh, one of my favorite movies is The Three Amigos. Shows, shows how deep I am. And we have the three amigos here today. I want them to stand. So if Dave, you could stand. And Brendan, if you could stand. And Ethan, if you could stand. <laughs> Look at these guys. Oh my <laughs> Don't you wish you had a shirt like that? <laughs> so anyway, yeah. So uh, And Brendan even wore a fanny pack just to be more like Dave. So yeah. <laughs> So uh, I didn't know Dave was a standard of how you dress when you go to church, but it looks like that, that's the way that it is. I'm not here to talk about that, though, but I uh, just thought I'd throw that in. I couldn't help myself. And uh, coming up on August the 13th, we are uh, having our baptismal service. And, uh, it, and it's after our outdoor service, which starts at 10 o'clock. And you see the address there. It's 1933 Tanager, right? Lakes Drive, which is where the Cadwells live. So just, if you know where they live, then that's where we're going to have it. And we have a baptism out there the last couple of years, and uh, it's a great time. And, you know, baptism is really important. Uh, we don't hear enough about it, I don't think. But, you know, the Bible says that you believe and then you are baptized. And baptism is nothing more than your public witness that you have trusted Christ. And you're following in him in, your, in the death and the burial and the resurrection of Christ. And so the early believers, they baptized. When somebody came to faith, they baptized them right then and there. They found water, and they just did it. And so uh, we're, if you've never been baptized and God's leading you to do that, um, you can let us know and save that date. And you can write it on one of our connection cards. There's a spot, actually, where it says, I'm interested in being baptized. And you can put that in the offering box on the right when you leave today. Also, you know, we are, have over the years rebaptized a lot of people. People who were maybe, you know, baptized as an infant and realize as they've grown in their walk and their faith that, hey, that's, that's great and that's good and my parents, you know, loved me and they wanted to get me baptized, but that's not really believer's baptism because I wasn't a believer when I was baptized. And so we, we would love to do that. And if you have questions about that, we'd love to talk to you about that. We've also rebaptized people who were sprinkled, 
who as they've grown in their walk and read through the Bible realize that immersion really demonstrates being buried, dying, being buried, and, and rising again with Christ. And so they've decided, you know, I want to get baptized to signify what's going on in my heart when I came to faith in Christ. So any of those things, if you have questions about that, feel free to contact the church, myself, Matt, any of the people on staff. Uh, we'd love to talk to you about it. But it's coming up, as I say, on August the uh, 17th or 13th. Yeah, August 13th. And that's on a Sunday, and we'd love to have you come. And if, hey, if you've never been to an outdoor service out there, we have a great time. It's a beautiful place. We have a great time fellowshipping with each other and worshiping the Lord. And then right after that, we go down to the, a lake that's right there by their house, and we get, people get baptized. And it's a great Sunday for Compass. And so we'd love to have you come. So write that date down. Thank you. Yeah, give, give the reverend a hand. <laughs> Thank you, Reverend Jones. You're all right, we all join me in prayer uh, before our service. Uh, Father, we again praise you. We thank you for this opportunity to gather here in your house. Uh, we pray now as Matt comes to deliver the message. We, uh, we just uh, pray, Father, that he delivers this bold and inspiring message this morning that's through you. Uh, we thank you for each and every person's being here. And uh, we ask these things in your name. Amen. Thanks, Skip. <clears throat> Give Skip a hand. Yeah. One of the most underappreciated things is when our elders come up here and, and, and give the announcements. We like to do it so we can show you who they are and you can be introduced to them and know who our church elders are, who's helping lead our church. But it, but it is intimidating to stand in front of a bunch of people and, and talk to them. That's, that's a hard thing to do. It's the number one fear in America. So I want to thank the elders uh, just publicly for, for doing that. It's really important for people to know who you are, and I know it's not easy all the time. But good morning and welcome to Compass. My name is Matt Collins. I'm one of the pastors here, and we are honored to have you here on this almost holiday weekend. On Tuesday, we celebrate the 246th anniversary of the sign of the Declaration of Independence. The Declaration, I know, 246 years. The Declaration, along with the other founding documents of the United States, were not only written by men who lived their life based on the ideals found in the Bible and a Christian worldview, but based most of the ideas we find in these founding documents on the Judeo-Christian values that we hold so dear. Although we do not have time this morning to discuss the breadth of these documents and how awesome they are, today's sermon ties well into these items and how the Christian ought to view the rights we are granted, not by our government, but by our creator. The same creator for which we are named, Christians, Jesus Christ himself. We're currently in the middle of a series based on the notion that we are named after the author and perfecter of our faith, as we read about in Hebrews 12. And the name of the series is, I am a Christian. I am a Christian. And we've covered a number of topics throughout the past few weeks. Each topic revolves around the idea that when we make the proclamation, I am a Christian, it comes with some fundamental ideas. And during the first week, we said that a person that proclaims to be a Christian must also pro proclaim, I am a believer. I'm a believer. We talked about the essential beliefs that one must hold to properly proclaim the title of this series. And what we believe about God, the Bible, Jesus, his church, and salvation determine whether we are actually his followers or something different. The next week, we talked about being part of a church and how important the church is for fulfilling the Great Commission. Here at Compass, we don't have church membership, but we do have partnership. We call people who attend Compass and call Compass, Compass their home partners in the gospel because they partner with us, and it's biblical. But not only is being part of, the, of, of a community centered on God beneficial for the partner, but it also proclaims to an unbelieving world what community ought to look like. When we talk about advancing God's kingdom, we show people what community looks like. Not perfect community, because we're still tied to our sinful nature, but what the idea of community is that God prescribes. During the third week, we talked about the distinction between calling ourselves Christian and actually being disciples of Jesus Christ. And Jesus never called us to convert. He never called us to, to really say a prayer. He asks us to follow him. 
He does command that we pray, and we'll talk about that later. But it's not like we can pray and then everything's good. See, he calls us to be a disciple. And one of the things we said about discipleship is salvation is free, but discipleship will cost you everything. And when we look at this, a disciple is actually one who follows, actively follows Jesus Christ. So to proclaim, I am a Christian, you ought to do so while you are actively doing what Jesus calls his followers to do. And last week, Kelly shared with with us that those who profess to be Christians also need to make the proclamation that I am a servant. And speaking of servant, I want to just want to, want to call out Dave and Brandon in the back. They're doing technology today. They're not used to doing this. It's the first time they've done it. But thank you so much for just stepping up and being servants. But Kelly talked about the sons of thunder and how they went through the process to understand what Jesus meant when he said, if you want to fully have your life, you've got to give it up for my sake. It was a great teaching, and if you weren't here, you should go to our website or YouTube or the app and really check it out. It was really great. You see, the series that we're currently doing has two points to it. It's doubly pointed. The first point is, (laughs) it's like a two-edged sword. That seems biblical. Uh, So the first point is to help Christians grow. That's really the first point of this. If you call yourself a Christian, one of your goals ought to be to mature in your faith. And that task is an unending task. There is no end to your maturation in your faith. If we're honest, we will never actually attain Christ-likeness fully while we're on this side of Christ's return. We can always grow. That's important. One of the things we heard Kelly say last week while he was studying for the sermon is he learned something new. He learned something new that he had never before really seen. And that's just one of the reasons that we are so blessed to have Kelly here as one of our pastors. He understands a very simple yet complex truth. Here it is. The more you mature as a Christian, the more you recognize your need to continue growing. The more you mature as a Christian, the more you recognize your need for continued growth. That's a fact. But the second reason is closely tied to the first. We want you as a Christian to be equipped and ready to explain what it means to be a Christian when you live your life in such a way, when you follow Christ so closely that people look at you and say, there's something different about that person. The way you view life, the way you have hope in this this crazy and messed up world, when people ask, we want you to be prepared to offer an answer. That's important. You see, one of the jobs for the leaders of Compass, the pastoral staff and the elders, is to equip the saints for the work of ministry. That's one of our jobs. So, You see, if you say you're a Christian, then you say you're a Christian on Sunday morning, but you're also a believer on Monday, you're a partner on Tuesday, you're a disciple on Wednesday, you're a servant on Thursday, and you see where I'm getting. It's a 24-7 identity. This week, we explore another fundamental aspect of what it means to be Christian, something for Christians to hold and use throughout their life, prayer. The title of this morning's sermon is, I am a prayer warrior. I'm a prayer warrior. Now, I need to be honest with you. Like Tom Rainer, the author of the book that has the same title as our series, I was a little perplexed when I first heard the phrase prayer warrior. When I first started exploring this whole following Jesus thing, I knew that prayer was something that Christians did. I knew it was something that a Christian ought to do, but I really didn't understand the significance that prayer ought to play in the life of a believer. I had no idea. So the phrase prayer warrior hit me in a weird way. I thought that it seemed like an overly aggressive way of saying that we ought to close our eyes and talk to God. It seemed weird. I had so many preconceived ideas of what prayer was before I actually became a follower of Christ and dove into his word and really tried to understand what it meant. But the truth is, my preconceived notions weren't only wrong, they, I, I, was, I had no idea the fulfilling, the, the fulfilling nature of what prayer actually is, and we're going to talk about that today. For those of you that know my story, you know that I was always knowledgeable about Jesus, but I was far from being one of his followers. I knew enough that, that I should stay close, but I certainly was not actively following or, or active in my faith and following Christ. I think the best way to describe me before I came to follow Christ before I moved to Oregon and dove into what it means to be a Christian is that I was a third class fan of the Messiah. I was a third class fan of the Messiah. 
There's a book that came out a number of years ago that helps illustrate this point. The book is titled, Not a Fan. And in this book, Pastor Kyle Eidemann says, the biggest threat to the church today is fans that call themselves Christian but aren't actually interested in following Christ. They want to be close enough to Jesus to get all the benefits, but not close enough that it requires anything from them. Eidemann's point is that Jesus calls us to be followers. He calls us to be actively participating in this whole Christian thing. Not people that are passive, or dare I say, lazy. Ironically, one of my Facebook friends posted the same quote on Facebook this week. It's, it's crazy how God works. You just kind of see it and you're like, oh, I guess I'm on the right path. Thanks. God can work through anything, including Facebook. Who knew? But ironically, when we look at this, we have to be honest. We have to be honest with ourselves. Are we a follower or are we a fan? Are we a Christian or are we a disciple? Are we a prayer warrior or not? And honestly, I have to, I have to say that this, this wasn't even me. I wasn't even a fan of Jesus. I was a third-class fan of the Messiah. That's, that's, that's really what it was. Using the sports analogy, not only was I not willing to get off the bench and get into the game, I wasn't even in the stands cheering. Not only was I not in the stands cheering, I wasn't even in the stadium only thing I liked was hearing about the great things and, and take credit because, hey, I'm American, I'm a Christian. But I'm, I'm, I'm part of that whole thing, but I really wasn't. I was a third-class fan, and I woke up to that. So the concept of this prayer, this whole prayer thing was lost on me. It wasn't something I totally understood. Now, don't get me wrong, I prayed a lot. I prayed often. Not always the right prayers. I mean, I prayed before every race in my track career, selfishly. I prayed in my car because there was more traffic than my time had allowed for. It was usually confession as well because I may have said some things I shouldn't have. <laughs> I prayed when the guys and I went out that our stupid decisions wouldn't be too stupid. And often they were. I even once prayed to God that when I was dating two women, they wouldn't find out. <laughs> it's an actual fact. I was, called, I was all kinds of messed up. But praise Jesus for this whole new creation thing, right? I mean, thank goodness. All I had to do was move across the country, lose everything that made me me and gave me my identity, and do a deep dive into the claims of Jesus and Christianity to realize I was messed up. But the Apostle Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 5 that if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. That's great news. And Paul isn't saying that this new creation is perfect. It's not what he's saying here. But he is saying that this new creation is completely forgiven. This new creation is filled with and guided by the Holy Spirit that now indwells them. And this new creation is prepared to get on the field and be an active member of the church, both globally and locally. And as a new creation, I had a whole new understanding of this thing called prayer. And although we'll dive into it, Prayer for the follower of Jesus is simply one of the best ways to communicate with God. That's what it is. The same guy who tells us we're a new creation tells us in 1 Thessalonians 5, 17 to pray without ceasing. Or to pray always, depending on what translation you're reading. A short yet demanding verse that simply means to have a consistent prayer life. That's what it means. It doesn't mean to walk through and, and talk prayers 24-7 just means to have a consistent prayer life. This verse is part of a closing that Paul's writing to the church in Thessalonica. And, and when he's writing this, it's important to not just see the, these three words, pray without ceasing, but to look at what's surrounding this as well to get some context for it. The passage is actually from verse 12 to 22. And I don't have it on the screens. If you have a Bible, you can flip to it. I want you to read along with me. But, but what surrounds this verse 17? I mean, it's five verses ahead of it and five verses after it and packed right directly in the middle are these three words, pray without ceasing. So, so what is Paul's final advice to us and the, through the Thessalonian in church? Here's what it is. Verse 12. And I'm reading out of the NLT here. It's a long passage. I just want to Make sure you know what translation I'm reading. Dear brothers and sisters, honor those who are your leaders in the Lord's work. They work hard among you and give you spiritual guidance. Show them great respect and wholehearted love because of their work and live peacefully with each other. Brothers and sisters, we urge you to warn those who are lazy. 
Encourage those who are timid. Take tender care of those who are weak. Be patient with everyone. See that no one pays back evil for evil, but always tries to do good to each other and to all people. Always be joyful. Never stop praying. Be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. Do not stifle the Holy Spirit. Do not scoff at prophecies, but test everything that is said. Hold on to what is good and stay away from every kind of evil. These, these 11 verses are packed. And right in the middle, right in the middle, it tells us never stop praying. So Paul gives advice to this church that we can learn a lot from. Along with always being joyful and encouraging others, Paul tells us to never stop praying. Never cease praying. Paul tells another church in Philippi, in Philippians 4, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. If you've been at Compass for a while, you've heard these verses preached. We've preached these from the front a number of times. But what does it look like in the life of a Christian practically? Again, there's something to be learned by looking at the verses surrounding Philippians 4, 6. So starting at 4 and reading through 9 in Philippians 4, it says this. And you're going you're to hear some commonalities between the other one too. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your heart and your minds in Christ Jesus. Pause there for a second. When, when we come, when we bring everything to God in prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, we don't have to be anxious, even though there's a lot of anxiety in this world, because our hearts will be guarded. Verse 8, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, pure, lovely, commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worth praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practicing these things, and the God of peace will be with you. Again, this comes towards the end of a letter that Paul's writing to a church, and it's advice he's giving them. And in it, it talks about prayer. A healthy daily prayer life is mentioned more than 250 times in Scripture. Why? Because it's an important part of the Christian life, one that I believe is grossly underutilized. Like Martin Luther said, to be a Christian without prayer is no more possible than to be alive without breathing. To be a Christian without prayer is no more possible than to be alive without breathing. Personally, when I'm in a place where I feel unable to deal with what life's tossing my way, undoubtedly I look at my life, my prayer life, and I see it's lacking. Oftentimes when I, when I get frustrated in life and don't know how I'm going to deal with what's going on, it's a direct correlation to how low my, li my prayer life is. Whenever we struggle, even in the slightest, it's important that we ask the question, how's my prayer life? How's my prayer life? So this morning, I want to talk about the reasons that a consistent, healthy prayer life is so important for the Christian. I want to explore why the proclamation, I am a Christian, must be correctly coupled with the phrase, I am a prayer warrior. That's what I want to dive into today. So what's a prayer warrior, and why does that make sense? Well, to get an idea of that, it's important for us to flip to Ephesians chapter 6. We did a series on Ephesians. It was called Unity. We did that in the summer of 2020, when, like today, we so desperately need it. We need unity. But in Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 17, Paul talks about the armor of God. You may have heard about it in Sunday school, but let's look at it real quick. Verse 10. A final word, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against his strategies of the, all strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of an unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly place. Pause for a second. Paul's talking to us about equipping ourselves, not for a physical war, although the people he's writing to probably understood what that looked like. He's talking about fighting a spiritual one. 
And so when we think about this, that's what he's talking about. So let's, let, let's see what actually this, this armor is. Verse 13, Therefore put on every piece of God's armor so you'll be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you will still be standing firm. Stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness. For shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you be fully prepared. In addition to all of these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery er arrows of the devil. Put on sal salvation as a helmet and take the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. This is the armor of God. There, there have been vacation Bible schools and camps based on these, these verses right here, these eight verses right here. And, and it's all over the world. It's, it's really well known. But it's important that we look at the next verse as well. The next verse is super important. Right after Paul tells us that we should put on the full armor of God and what each piece is, he says this in verse 18. Pray in the Spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. So God tells you to dress up in this armor. Put on, put on the full armor of God. Don't neglect any part of it. And when you do, pray in the Spirit at all times. That's what he's saying. So after we're fully dressed in this tactical suit of spiritual warfare, Paul tells us to pray. This is the concept of a prayer warrior. This is it. This is why we call our prayer team here at Compass the prayer warrior team. Because we know it's a battle. Not one of, of, of physical war, but one of spiritual war. And we're so thankful for our prayer warrior team here at Compass because they lift up so many prayer requests. They're so dedicated. I'm so thankful for them. And although prayer is hard, and sometimes it's easy to forget to do, and if I'm honest, even awkward at times, especially when we're praying out loud with people around us, we pray to a God that hears our prayers and walks alongside us in those difficult situations that drive us to our knees. And when life drives us to our knees, well, guess what? That's the perfect posture for prayer. And thankfully, prayer does not lie on the ability of the person praying, but on the God that hears them. Amen? I'm a flawed individual. I will pray for you all over the place. But don't expect me to fix things that I can't fix. But the God I pray to on your behalf He's worth it. So now that we've discussed the term prayer warrior and how correct of a term it is, let's answer the next question. Why should I pray? Why should I pray? As a Christian, why is prayer such a big deal? If I'm ready to call myself a Christian, why must I also call myself a prayer warrior? Simple. Because Jesus commanded you to. Done. I could stop right now, close my binder, walk out of here. Done. Jesus commands you to. But I've written more, so I'm going to say it. Sorry. I can't tell you how many people I've asked over the years about why they pray or, or why Christians should pray or how we should pray. And you know what the most popular answer isn't? Obedience to Jesus in Luke 18. I don't often hear that. But if we look at Luke 18, here it is. One day, Jesus told his disciples a story to show that they should always pray and never give up. Jesus, tells, Jesus told stories to make points, right? That We call them parables. And this story is called the parable of the persistent widow. And you can go and read it. I'm not going to dive into it terribly here. But, but what he's saying, his point here is that this. As a disciple, you should understand that you should always pray and never give up. And since we've already covered the, the fact of I am a disciple portion of this series, Jesus commands you to pray as well. If you call yourself a disciple, you best be praying. Because the disciple follows the teacher, and Jesus is your teacher. So not only is Jesus our model for prayer, but he commands us to pray. Now, I know I don't really have to go on, but I'm going to. I actually have five simple reasons why we should pray. Five simple, applicable reasons why we should, why we should pray. And no matter where you are in your prayer life, in your maturity, as, you're, as you walk as, as a Christian, no matter where you are, here's five reasons why you should step up your prayer game. Here it is. Number one. Prayer gives you an opportunity to share all aspects of your life with God. Prayer gives you an opportunity to share all aspects of your life with God. Yes, it's true that God knows everything that's going on in your life already. He's omniscient. He knows everything. But prayer is a conversation that aids in your relationship status with him. That's what it does. Far too often we wonder why our relationship with God feels so strained, feels so off. And God's like, I'm still here. 
I'm still right here. We may post our relationship status with God as it's complicated, but God posts back, it's desired. I want your relationship. James 4.8 says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Jesus' relationship status with you is desired. The way we draw near to God is through reading his word, through the fellowship with other believers, and you guessed it, prayer. Two, prayer provides a platform for confessing our sin and getting the help we need to repent and overcome it. It gives us an opportunity to confess, a platform to confess our sins to him. And we'll talk more about this as we celebrate communion later on in a couple minutes. But confession is a big part of a healthy prayer life. Now, I can think of at least two responses to this number two part right here. The first is, confession stinks. No, nobody wants to confess sin. It means we have to say it out loud. We would rather just have it simply disappear. And it, that would be easier. It's not always possible. Oftentimes, when we don't confess our sin promptly to the Lord, we end up aiding in the hiding of our sin, which isn't really hiding. It just shows up later on, usually with sin added to it. But we just wish sin would disappear. More specifically, we, we wish its effects would disappear. But confession is what does that, not sweeping it under the rug. The second thing I think I would hear a response of is that we don't have anything to confess. What do I have to confess? I've been pretty good this week. The only person that doesn't need to confess and never needed to confess was Jesus Christ himself. That's it. And since you ain't Jesus... You ain't kidding nobody that you're this whole I haven't sinned this week thing. I love the way Psalm 32, 5 says it. It says, I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgression to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. That's awesome, awesome Psalm by David. It's really neat. It's a promise. He forgives. Point three. Prayer offers us an opportunity to express gratitude for the things in life that he has provided. Although we're often focused on the difficult situations in life or, or the bad thing, there's always something to be grateful for. It's funny, I, I have a kid. I have two of them, actually. And when I get something for one of them, the other one undoubtedly says this, you never get me anything. And I, and I look them up and down and look at all the clothes that I bought and the shoes they have on their foot and the, and the food they're eating. Really? I've gotten you nothing? Ever? Sometimes when we see something that upsets us or, or hurts us or challenges us, we tend to only focus on that. And it's important that we don't do that. Sometimes we need to sit back and take a moment to recalibrate ourselves on what God's actually given us. Did you wake up this morning? Do you have air in your lungs? Then you can do God's work. It's an opportunity to be thankful, even in the trials. First Chronicles 16, which is, which is kind of a psalm in the middle of the book of Chronicles. I didn't realize this. As I was, as I was researching this and I read First Chronicles 16, I read it and I was like, this, this is a psalm. What's it doing in the book of Chronicles? But David wrote this in the middle of Chronicles, and here's what it says. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. So even in the Old Testament, when when life is hard and war's going on and, 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 and stuff's happening, Dave writes down, be thankful. So use prayer as a time of thanksgiving. I said these were five simple things. Here's number four. Prayer is a way to communicate to God what you need. It's a way to communicate to God what you need. The fancy word for this is supplication. We saw this in the passage that Paul wrote to the Philippians, right? Through prayer and supplication. So let, let's be real. There are things in life that we can't get ourselves. There are things in life that we are not capable of doing ourselves. We need God's help. Now, this isn't to say that God's some sort of cosmic vending machine. That's not what I'm saying. God's not a vending machine that we can just put money in and make our selection and then eat some stale donuts. That's not who he is. But he's also not a God that expects that we do everything on our own. We're in relationship with him. And it's important we remember that. That relationship means he walks along life with us. He walks through our trials. He walks along 
us, along with us, as we're, as we're going through some tough times, and he's there. As a relatively new Christian, I didn't grow up in the church. I grew up kind of around churches, but never in one, never, never professed to really be a Christian or follower of Christ. As, an, as a person that came to faith as an adult, I hear some things that are popular in some churches, and they make me smile because I wonder, is that really biblical? Is that, is it, or is it just nice to say? Here's one. God will never give you anything you can't handle. You guys ever heard that? Yeah. Doesn't seem biblical to me. Nope. Just, uh, I, I think this is meant to be encouraging, but it just isn't true. You will encounter things in life that are too hard to do on your own. And in those times, you're meant to lean on God and you're meant to lean on God's people to support you through those times. That's why the church is so important. That's why it's important to be a member of a church. But when I think about God will never give you anything you can't handle, I think to myself, tell that to Joseph when his crappy brothers sold him in a ca- caravan of people just running by. Or, or, or maybe tell that to Joseph when he refuses to make out with his boss's wife and then she lies about it and he ends up in jail. God will never give you anything you can't handle. Or, or maybe tell that to John when he's stranded on the island of Patmos and he thinks that, you know what, this is it. I'm done. Or tell that to the prophet Elijah when he's hiding in a cave because Jezebel is trying to kill him. Or or how about Peter? Peter, when he's facing scrutiny from the religious elite simply for proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ up to the point where he is crucified, but not crucified in the way that Jesus was because he doesn't feel himself worthy of it, but he asks to crucify himself upside down. God will never give you anything he can't handle. In all these situations... These people have turned to God. When life gets too hard to handle, turn to God and turn to God's people. That's why we're here. But in all these situations, when you turn to God, be bold and ask him for things. That's okay to do. After all, it's like what Sarah says. No asky, no getty. (laughs) Before moving on to the fifth and final reason, a Christian ought to up his prayer life game or her prayer life game. I'm going to look back at these first four here but because they can all be summed up with the acronym ACTS. Now you, you, you may have heard this before and, and uh, when I first came to faith and I first came on staff here at Compass Church, actually Kelly shared this with me but uh, he got it from someone else and it, I'm not quite sure where it originated from but, but this acronym follows these four right here. Here's what it, here's what it is. A. Acknowledge acknowledge. Yes, God knows everything and he's God of the universe. Begin your prayer by acknowledging who he is. Hey, we pray every Sunday morning as 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 a team before church starts. It's one of my favorite times of the week. This morning, Kelly actually started his prayer with taught with acknowledge. Hey, God of the universe, we're just so humbled to be here and so humbled that you have a a relationship with us. He started with acknowledging who God is. That's great. He not only tells people to do it, he does it himself. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. That's the A. The C stands for confession. Now, we talked about confession, but let's be honest. Confession clears the air. When you confess something, it's like a, like a weight has been lifted off your chest. And you can have a real conversation. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. The T, thanksgiving. Be thankful for everything, but most of all, be thankful for God's will. God's will in your life. I'm so thankful God's will prevails when mine fails. I mean, my, my will is stupid, dumb, and selfish. If I want to do my own thing, all the time I end up in a bad situation. But if I pray for God's will and follow his will and put mine aside, I'll always lead someone great. Somewhere great. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And finally, S stands for supplication. Ask for something. Give us today our daily bread. Give us today our daily bread. Now, some of these words that I've said here actually come from a series that Kelly did right before this series started called Living the Lord's Prayer. And if we think about living the Lord's Prayer, if we made up the prayer ourselves instead of Jesus, which tells you about our flawed nature, but if we made up this prayer ourselves, we probably wouldn't honor God first. We probably wouldn't confess. We probably wouldn't think. We'd probably be like, 
hey God, give me my bread. That's, that's probably how we'd put it down. But there are plenty of ways for people to, to remember how we ought to pray and to bolster our prayer life. Acts is just one of those ways. I was actually listening to a podcast this week, and ironically, here's how, here's how God works, right? I listen to this podcast, and all of a sudden, podcast comes up, prayer for beginners. Cool, I'll listen to that. So I, I listened to that. It was only a nine-minute podcast. It was really neat. But this person, his name's Father Mike. I don't know if anybody listened to his podcast, but his, he used an acronym called TAR, T-A-R. Same thing. Tell, ask, rely. It helps us understand what prayer ought to be. There might be hundreds of acronyms out there that help us understand the importance of prayer. But the most important thing is just do it. Just pray. That's so important. Oftentimes we don't. And when I say do a better job praying, I don't mean use different words that sound more Christian-y. I don't mean sit in a certain way. I don't mean hold your hands in the proper position or even keeping your eyes closed. Just pray. Just go to God and pray. I remember bringing some teenagers to the Tenderloin District on a mission trip one year. And the way we start out our mission trip always is to do a prayer walk around the Tenderloin District. Now, I don't know if you guys have been to the Tenderloin District in San Francisco, but it's a, it's a pretty rough and rundown area. So we begin by walking around the city. And I have this group of high schoolers from Bend who half of them have never been outside of Bend, and they're seeing this guy take a poop on the side of the sidewalk. And they're like, I don't, know, I don't know what to do. And so we're praying, and I'm standing outside this group, keeping my eyes open, making sure that all the kids are safe, because if I come home with one less kid, it's probably an issue. So, so I'm making sure the kids are safe, and I'm praying, but I'm praying with my eyes open. I'm keeping an eye on things. I'm making sure kids are safe. And I wonder to myself, is, is that really faithful praying? Can I really pray with my eyes open? Is that biblical? I mean, everybody I see pray, they pray with their eyes closed. Like, am I wrong if I pray with my eyes open? And then, crazy enough, I read John 17. Check out how John 17 starts. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted his eyes to heaven and said, and then he begins what we call the high priestly prayer. Now, Kelly talked about this during his series, but what we call the Lord's Prayer is more the disciples' prayer. If you want to read the Lord's Prayer, this is it. Read John 17. That's some homework for you. But Jesus lifted his eyes up to heaven and prayed. So if Jesus can pray with his eyes open, so can I. That's pretty exciting. Or maybe I need to pray longer. I mean, I've seen some people pray some pretty long prayers. Maybe I need to be, be more in an elaborate prayer and, 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 and use words and, and just make sure that these are long and fulfilled. Kind of like the sermon, right? But if I, look at, if I look at Nehemiah 2, it says this. Then the king said to me, said to Nehemiah, what are you requesting? So I prayed to the God of heaven and said to the king, if it pleases the king and if, you, if your servant has found favor in your sight, that you may send me to Judah, to the city of my father's graves, that I may rebuild it. In the middle of a conversation, Nehemiah shoots up a quick prayer. Prayers don't have to be long. They can be quick prayers, just like here. If Nehemiah can throw up a quick prayer in the middle of a conversation, so can I. So can you. So pray without ceasing. Pray through the day. Pray in your car. Keep your eyes open. But pray wherever you're at, throughout the day. We've come up with some ideas of, of what we should be doing when we pray and how it can be effective, but the truth is this. The most effective prayer is a humble and honest prayer. Let's work hard to have that. And that leads us to our final point. Prayer helps us align with God's will. Prayer helps us align with God's will. His will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Not mine, but his. When we spend time in God's word, with God's people, and in prayer, we start to change. The Holy Spirit changes us. And instead of trying to push our desires on God, hey God, here's what I need, our prayers start to evolve. And they change into hey God, what can I do so your will will be fulfilled on earth as it is in heaven? Let's pray. <clears throat> Lord, thank you for giving us a channel and a way to communicate with you. Lord, I know you are all-knowing and all-present. 
But Lord, we can sit down and, and talk to you anytime we want. Eyes open, eyes closed, standing, sitting, kneeling, hands open, hands closed, wh whatever, Lord, you accept us because you love us. You loved us so much that you sent your son to die on a cross for us. And Jesus loves us so much that he endured the cross. He became obedient to death, even death on a cross. And we're so thankful for that. That when, when we confess with our mouth that he is Lord and believe in our hearts that he's raised from the dead, that we will be saved. And part of being saved is to be able to do life with you. So Lord, I'm so thankful that we can do life with you. We can do life through your word, reading the Bible. We can do life through prayer. We can do life alongside other believers and community. Actually doing the things that help your will on earth be proclaimed. God, I'm so thankful that we get to not only proclaim we are a Christian, but we can do so without major persecution. And Lord, even if there was persecution, Lord, I pray for the strength to still boldly proclaim who you are in our life, not just on Sunday morning, but to be a believer on Monday, a disciple on Tuesday, a church member on Wednesday, a servant on Thursday, and a prayer warrior on Friday. Lord, help us live out this 24-7 identity as we move forward. We love you, and in your name we pray. Amen. So at this time, we uh, are going to make a little transition into our time of communion. And uh, here at Compass, we do communion maybe a little differently than maybe what you're used to, or maybe if you're visiting with us, you've ever done before. But we have two stations, one on the left here in the back and one on the right. On the left, we actually have gluten-free. It's not really bread. It's a cracker, but you can use that if you have uh, gluten issues. And we have a, a bowl of juice and a piece of bread. And we take the bread, which represents his body, and we dip it in the juice, which uh, represents his blood. And then we partake. And we get up and we just go back as God leads you to go and to fulfill uh, this thing of communion. Uh, communion is for those who know Jesus. It was designed by God for us to remember him and what he did for us on the cross. And if you're here today and you're a seeker or you're here today and you, and you know you're not a believer, feel free not to participate. Um, we, do, we don't do it where we pass it down the aisle and you don't need to walk back and feel like you have to do this because everybody else is doing it. Uh, actually, it'd be better if you didn't do it. But if you know him today, you don't need to be a member of our church. As Matt says, we don't have membership, so that's impossible. And if you know Jesus today, we ask you to fellowship with us as we fellowship with him and feel free to join us as we participate today. You know, the Bible talks about that before we get together and before we go back and take the bread and the cup, um, it says a man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. And this examination is really just God saying, hey, um, look at your life. If there's something between me and God that's hindering God's spirit working in my life, I need to make it right with him. And Matt talked about it today. It was a great sermon for communion because he talked about confession. And the word confess means to agree. All you're doing when you confess to God is God already knows that maybe there's sin in your life. You agree with God. You say, God, I agree with you that my attitude's been really bad this week. And I just ask that you would forgive me. So you're just coming into an agreement with what God already knows that's going on in your life. And then when we pick up the bread and we take the bread, remember Jesus said that he took the bread and when he had given thanks, he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So when we grab the piece of bread, it's just to remind us. And we remember that he gave his life on the cross. He shed, you know, his blood and his body was given for us that through that we might have eternal life and forgiveness. And then it says he took the cup and he said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. And the juice represents this new covenant that we have with God through, through faith in him. It doesn't become the blood of Christ. It represents the blood of Christ. And it's just a reminder. So when you pick up the bread today and you think about this is Jesus, this is he gave his life for me. And then you can, when you dip it in the juice, you can say, hey, he shed his blood. 
Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. There is no forgiveness. And he says this represents that. And then when you partake, you can just do what? You can do the thanksgiving, right? This is the time we're just grateful. Lord, I am so grateful that you did for me the one thing I couldn't do for myself, which I could not die for my own sins. But Jesus did for all of us. So that's what communion means. And we're going to do that together in just a moment. So before we do that, I want us just to take a moment and to have a chance to pray before the Lord and confess. If there's something that's not right, just, just make it right right now. And then we'll partake together. And then at the very end, I love what Jesus says. He says, whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. In other words, when we celebrate communion, we are proclaiming that Jesus died for us on the cross and that he rose again. And one day we're going to do it with him in heaven. Imagine that communion service. Unbelievable, right? Yeah, when he's dishing it out, it'll be like, whoa, man, this is, I can't even imagine what that's going to be like. I really can't. Awesome. Yeah, so cool. So let's just bow our heads and examine our hearts. And I will pray to close that section out. And then as the Lord leads you, feel free to get up and go back to one of the tables and partake of the Lord's table together. Father in heaven, we are um, so grateful for the mercy that you've shown upon us, that your love for us is so great, that you sent your son, Jesus. And we admit that we are sinful people and we have issues. And we are so thankful that if we confess them to you, you forgive us and you wash us totally clean and you remove them from us as far as the east is from the west. We can't even imagine how that can happen. And you remember them no more. Lord, that's just unbelievable to us. So we're so thankful for who you are and what you've done for us today. Father, I just pray for the, our church compass here that if we have sinned against people or our community, if there's something that we have done that we don't know about that we can make right, Lord, I, I pray that you'd reveal that to us so that we as a church can be in right relationship with each other as well as with you. So we confess our own sins, Lord, before you. Lord, I'm just reminded again that Jesus loves us, that he gave his life, he shed his blood, that we might be eternally forgiven. And we give you the praise and the glory, and we are thankful from the bottom of our heart for freedom, freedom in spirit, freedom from sin, freedom from the misery that the world has to offer us in our mind, that you have set us free. And we're excited about that. And we give you the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. As God leads you, get up and take communion.
the most awesome sauce day. You know that you're loved. Oh, and it's Sean Palmer's birthday. Happy birthday, Sean. Make sure you wish Sean Palmer a happy birthday. Also, have a great 4th of July. Oh, it's his birthday, too. Nice. What? Dwayne. Dwayne. Dwayne as well. Uh, feel free to sing them happy birthday out loud. I do it here, but nobody wants to hear that. Hey, have, have a great 4th of July. Enjoy your, your friends and your family, and enjoy the fire on the butte, fireworks from the butte, sorry. Uh, but have a safe holiday. We're so psyched you chose to be here for this holiday weekend. 